let's give our full attention and a warm welcome to Tim Chafee. All right, thank you, and good afternoon. I can say that now. I was waiting for the second to tick over. So, good afternoon. Good, you guys agree, at least most of you. The rest of you are kind of quiet. How many of you are making your first trip to the Creation Museum today? That's fantastic. Welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're making your second or third trip, we're glad too. If it's fourth or fifth, maybe not so much. No, I'm kidding. You're all welcome. We pray that this day will be a blessing to you, that this presentation will be a blessing as well. Let me ask you this. How many have been to the Ark Encounter already? Or, and how many are planning on going maybe tomorrow or later today or in the next couple of days? Awesome. Well, again, pray that that would be a blessing as well. This talk, what I want to do is go over some of the skeptical questions that people have about Noah and about the Ark and about the Flood and uh, show you that if we start from Scripture, we can answer those questions. So I have what I think is really the coolest job in the world. I get to work behind the scenes uh, for the Creation Museum, for the Ark Encounter. I work with the design team, the people who make all those really cool things that you see as you go through here. I can't even like draw a stick figure, at least not a very good one. And these guys are making incredible things. I get to do the writing for the exhibits. So when you go through the exhibits and you read the signs, if you like what you read, that means I did a good job. If you don't like what you read, well, we need to have a chat. You've got to learn to like it. No. <laughs> it means you've got to read it again. Or it means I had a bad editor. I'm not sure. It's one of those. But it can't be my fault, right? Um, but I love what I do, and then I get to go and share with people. So if you stick around till the end, I'm going to actually give you a little bit of behind the scenes at the Ark Encounter as well, show you how we did some of the things that we did. I shouldn't say we, how my team that I'm a part of did, because I've had very little to do with the artistic part. But here's a picture of me with my beautiful Packers t-shirt on. Um, hey, all right, we've got, must be a bus from the right state. <laughs> um, that's my hometown. Actually, there's a picture of me my, with my lovely wife, Casey. And you can tell this was taken shortly after the ark opened. Why? Because there's no ramp on the front of the ark. Now, if you were to look at it, it would look more like this. This picture was taken about a month ago, and you can see that it's a lot uh, lusher around there with uh, the, the greenery and uh, the, you know, everything is built up, and we're continuing to develop the area. This picture was taken a while back. If you were to see off to the right side there, uh, we are building a multi-purpose auditorium that will be much bigger than this one, uh, about 2,500 seats in that other one, along with some classrooms and other things. So uh, we're building up there on the back side of the ark. On the left side, we're more than doubling the size of the zoo. And we're going to include a lot of teaching points that are, they've already been written and the signs have been designed. So now we just got to wait for the construction to be finished. And uh, we're continuing to develop that whole site. So if you've been once before, you got to make sure you check it out again. And if you're going tomorrow, well, then you're going to want to come back, you know, several months later when those other things are done. Um, so here's what it looks like on the inside. It's just a gorgeous structure. In fact, we like to say that it's an attraction within an attraction within an attraction. And what do we mean by that? Well, each of the exhibits that you can see a couple of on the back side there, those in and of themselves are an attraction. And then the inside of the ark, just looking at the architecture and how it was done, how the, the huge timbers are put together, that in it is an attraction. And then when you see the ark on the outside, especially for the first time when you get up close to it and you realize how big it is, that's an attraction as well. So why does this subject matter? Why do we spend so much time talking about the ark and about the flood and about Noah? Why is that a big deal? You know, people say, well, you should just be preaching about Jesus. Well, I agree that we should be preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and that's the most important thing we can be doing. But a lot of times we also have to clear up those skeptical questions people have. Take a look at this. This is one of the reasons that it matters. These are very common online. Young people are seeing these cartoons that are made by skeptics mocking the idea of the flood, mocking the biblical accounts in Genesis, particularly the flood account. Now, these are just two of the ones that I could show you. The rest of them, there's hundreds of them, are extremely vulgar and vile, so I can't show them in this kind of a setting. And I wouldn't want to anyways in any setting. But um, they, they love to mock the idea of the flood. In fact, we had uh, dozens and dozens of protesters who were atheists and agnostics there on opening day, July 7, 2016. And they were holding up signs, protesting, and, and some of us went down there and uh, got into some good conversations with them and uh, had an opportunity to witness some of them. And I had the privilege of, at the end of their protest, taking 21 of them on a tour through the ark on opening day. So for me, opening day became far better than I ever imagined it would be. Uh, because I had an opportunity to answer a lot of their questions. We did a Q&A session on the top, top floor, and then I even got to share the gospel with them as well. And I want you to take a look at their faces here. Notice they're not screaming and yelling at me, 
And I'm not doing that back. Why? Because we took the time to get to know them and treat them with gentleness and respect, and they listened. I'm not saying anybody fell on their knees and believed at that point. That's not my, my point here. But at least they listened. And they heard the answers. They heard the gospel. But see, what happens far too often is we tend to think of a lot of these people as being like the really staunch, devout atheists, like Richard Dawkins, you know, people who are really obnoxious and just hate God. It's better to call them misotheists than atheists. They, they are haters of God, not necessarily just not believers in God. And um, they tend to think of all Christians as being like Westboro Baptists, you know, people who hold up the, the offensive signs at military funerals and everything. And the truth is, it's not like that. You know, we're not like that. And many times they're just more like your neighbor next door. And we need to treat them with gentleness and respect and show them the love of Christ. And then we'll have an opportunity to share the gospel. So opening day was a, a great experience for me because I got to do that. And in fact, I, would, I, I, I mean this when I say it, I would do that every day of my life if I could. It was really pretty special. So let's deal with some of these skeptical questions. And the first one actually comes from within the church itself most of the time. In fact, the first couple questions usually come from within the church. Wasn't it just a local flood? There are some Christians who have believed the idea that the earth is billions of years and billions of years old, and they think those rock layers that we see out there are evidence of billions of years. And so they say, well, you can't have a worldwide flood because a worldwide flood would rip up all those layers and lay down new ones. You no longer have the evidence for billions of years. And so they say, well, it must have just been a local, a regional flood, or maybe it was just a worldwide flood that left no evidence. <laughs> yeah, you can laugh at that idea. It's, a flood that leaves no evidence is really, it's an oxymoron. There's no such thing. Okay, water is very powerful. Anybody who has a gravel driveway during a rainstorm knows what I'm talking about. Okay, because that driveway often disappears, especially if it's on a hill. Um, so the, the idea that it left no evidence would be absurd, but... What about this idea of a local flood? Does the Bible allow for that? Here's what we want to do with each of these questions. We want to go back to Scripture because that's where we want to start our thinking from. We're going to start from God's Word. He's the one who knows everything. He's always been there, and he cannot lie. So 13 times in the flood account, it tells us that the purpose of the flood was to destroy all flesh. All flesh is used 13 times in the flood account. What do you think it means when it's used over and over and over again like that? Just some of the flesh? All, all the flesh that was on, all the land-dwelling creatures that were outside the ark died. Everything in whose nostrils was the breath of life that lived on the land was gone. They died. The Bible is very clear on that. That can't happen in a local flood. It only happens with a worldwide flood. The size of the ark tells us this is not a local flood because if it was just a local flood, you only have to bring the animals from that region. Okay, and you don't need to have as much space to bring animals to, you know, representatives of each animal kind from all over the world. The floodwaters tell us this is not a local flood. Remember, the Bible tells us that the waters covered the highest hills or the highest mountains to the depth of 15 cubits. That's this measurement times 15, so about 22 feet or so. Once it goes over the top of the highest hills or the highest mountains, guess what it no longer is? It's no longer local, okay, because water will just keep flowing over the top of it and it will flood. There's nothing to hold it back and it will cover the whole globe. The duration of the flood tells us this is not a local flood. How long were they in the ark? About a year. We often think of the flood as being 40 days and 40 nights. Well, that was the initial flood mechanism that lasted that long. The waters dominated the earth for about 150 days before they started to go back down. They were in the ark for about a year. That's way longer than local floods. Now, local floods can be devastating, and they can last for a while, but they don't last that long. And why build an ark in the first place? Think about this. If God's just going to flood one region, don't you think he could have said, Hey, Noah, I want you to take you and your family and um, just skedaddle out of there for a little while. Let me show you a new place to live, and then once I drown everybody here, you can move back. Well, we can figure that out. Don't you think God could? Well, actually, God doesn't have to figure anything out. He knows everything now. Okay? He doesn't have to think through it like we do. So if we know that, well, God certainly could know that. So why would he have Noah spend years and years of his life building an ark that is really unnecessary if it's just a local flood? And what about this? Why bring birds? If it's a local flood, why are you bringing the flying creatures? Because they can do something that most other animals can't. During a flood, they can, they can fly out of there. So it doesn't even make sense to bring flying creatures, and yet the Bible's very clear he had to bring the flying creatures. The New Testament tells us that only eight people survived the flood, and Jesus uses it to compare... Uh, that judgment to his second coming. So if that was just a local judgment in Genesis, then maybe when he returns, it's just a local judgment? What do you think? 
No, that's not really an option, is it? There were huge changes that took place at the time of the flood. We believe that there was one continent on the earth prior to the flood. The Bible says in Genesis 1, all the waters were gathered in one place. It seems like all the land would have been in one place as well. Also, the way that it's described in Genesis 2 doesn't match any place on earth. It's, it's very different the way the world is described there. And there's also some other changes like dietary restrictions. You know, before the flood, they were told to eat plants. That's what Adam and Eve were told. And then after the flood, Genesis 9, 3, one of my favorite verses, now you can eat meat. Okay, that's paraphrased. And I think the most important reason for us to believe that this is a worldwide flood is because at the end of it, God puts the rainbow in the sky and says, this is my a reminder or my promise to you that I will never again, never again, never again, three times he says that, flood, destroy the earth with a flood like this. If it was just a local flood, and we have local floods today, then that means every time you see a rainbow, God lied. And yet the Bible tells us it's impossible for God to lie. It says that multiple times. Not just that he doesn't want to or just that he chooses. No, it it is impossible for him to lie. So when somebody says, can God do all things? The answer is no, he can't lie. There are a lot of things he can't do. He can do all things that are consistent with his perfectly good nature. And so he cannot lie. The rainbow tells us that this is a worldwide flood. So there are a lot of reasons from Scripture to believe this is a worldwide flood. That's not even counting the geologic evidence we have for it. So, how about the construction of the ark? Let's deal with some questions that have to do with this issue. And this, first, this one also comes from within the church. When we were building the ark, I used to get this question quite a bit, in fact, but it wasn't worded this nicely. A lot of times it had a lot of colorful language inclu- you know, directed at us for building an ark that wasn't box-shaped. Uh, they were really upset, saying, you guys are making it look like Hollywood. You're compromising the Bible. The Bible says it was a box. No, the Bible does not say it was a box. The Hebrew word is teva. Okay, it only appears outside of the flood account in one place. That's at Exodus chapter 2. Two different verses there. Anybody know what's happening in Exodus 2, why it uses that word? There was a little baby named Moses who was placed into an ark of bulrushes. Did that have to be a box? No, you see, most of the time the words don't tell you the shape of something. And many times they tell you the function, the purpose of something. And in both these cases, Noah's huge ark and Moses' little ark, What was the purpose? To save, preserve, protect life, right? Life preservers. And that's really what this word is describing. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Most likely it's an Egyptian loan word, which makes sense. Moses is writing this. Moses grew up where? Egypt. Um, But it's from their word for sarcophagus. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Because sarcophagus is where you put dead bodies. That doesn't seem like life preserving, except in Egyptian theology, what do they think they were doing? preserving them for the afterlife. So now it does make sense, doesn't it? So it's telling us the dimensions. The Bible gives the dimensions. It doesn't tell us the shape. If I told you I'm six foot eight inches tall, that means at the very top of my head, that's how tall I am. I know some of you are like, you're not that tall. And you'll come up afterwards and look, I I am, okay? I'm not going to lie to you when you can check it right afterwards. But um, I'm one anyways. But that doesn't mean I'm a rectangle, Okay? It just means at the very top of my head, when you give the dimensions of something, you're just giving the longest measurement. You're not saying it's a, a cube or it's a, a... So if you give the dimensions of a car, you're just giving the longest dimensions each direction. And that's what's happening here with the ark. So it doesn't mean that it was box-shaped. How about this? How many people built the ark? Who says eight people? Who's not going to answer questions today? Okay. <laughs> Who says eight people? So Noah, his wife, their three sons and their wives. How many people say just Noah? Hebrews 11, 7, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. So was he the only one swinging the hammer, do you think? That'd be quite a task. But let me ask you this. Did Solomon build the temple? Yes and no, right? I mean, yeah, this, is this the answer? <laughs> because Solomon probably didn't move any of the blocks into place, but he was in charge of the project. So you can say Solomon built the temple, Right. Noah built the ark. It doesn't mean that he was out there swinging it. You know, maybe he was, and I think he probably was, but it doesn't mean he was the only one. He's just in charge of the project. That's what it means. So could he have had extended family members helping out? If he's got siblings living nearby, if his dad lived nearby, he died five years before the flood. His grandfather died uh, the year of the flood. If they lived nearby, which we don't know if they did, but they could have helped for a while, correct? Um, what about construction crews? People, a lot of times people think, no, there's no way he could do construction crews because these people didn't believe. There's no way they would work for him. Well, if there's a paycheck coming in, right, then many people might be willing to work even if they don't agree with the message. 
when we were building the ark encounter, I took this picture. You can see in the back there where the ark is unfinished. And then when you look down here at the back of this car, what is that little symbol right there? Anybody know? You should be familiar with it. In the middle, it says FSM, Flying Spaghetti Monster. And we laugh, but why should we be familiar with it? Because that's what the atheists use to mock the Jesus fish. They'll say there's no evidence for, for some cosmic sky god zombie that you guys believe in, so we're just going to say the flying spaghetti monster made it, and they call themselves Pastafarians. This is very common. And I think there's just as much evidence for this as there is for God who became a man and walked this earth for 30 plus years in Israel about 2,000 years ago. Okay? No, we have evidence for our God. They don't. But anyways, this person apparently did a good job working on the ark because when you go to the ark, you see that there was a, it was done really well. That didn't mean they had to agree with the message just to be a contractor on the project. And the same thing could be true in Noah's day. And think about how great this would be for Noah. Noah could be like, you know what? I'll pay you as soon as it stops raining. <laughs> no, I don't think he did that. Okay, that's just what he told the bank with the loan. <laughs> I don't think that either. All right. Um, so, anyways, how many people built the ark? The answer is we just don't know. All right. So, what is gopher wood? People would say, hey, are you guys building the ark out of the same thing that Noah built his ark out of? And I'd say, yep, wood. No, no, no. Are you building it out of gopher wood? And the answer is, um, I don't know. What's gopher wood? Okay, we, we aren't 100% sure what that is because it's only used one time in the Bible, Genesis 6:14. make an ark of gopher wood. So we're not entirely sure what it is, what kind of trees came from that. Now, if Douglas fir and or Engelman spruce came from that, then the answer is yes, we built it out of gopher wood. Okay, because that's what we use for a lot of the heavy timbers there. Uh, some Bibles will say that it was Cyprus, but here's what they're doing, and this is, this is really a mistake because they're saying, look at the Middle East today, what kind of lumber or what kind of trees are there that could be used to build a big boat? Why is that a mistake? Well, did he build the ark in the Middle East? Was there a Middle East? Just because it landed in, in the, that region after the flood doesn't mean that's where it started. Okay, the world was very different. It's not like they just went up and anchored and just stayed in the same spot the whole time. They would get carried along by the wind and the waves. So we don't know where they were when they built it. So ultimately... What is gopher wood? The answer is, we just don't know. Uh, all right? So how about this one? How long did it take to build the ark? A lot of people think 120 years. That comes from this verse in Genesis 6, 3. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. And people think, see, there's a countdown to the flood. And even if that's the right way to interpret that verse, and other people think that maybe this verse should be interpreted as like a shortening of man's lifespan from over 900 years down to the 120, but whichever way you take that verse, nothing here says that Noah started building the ark at this point. In fact, the ark isn't mentioned for like another uh, 11 verses. So it's not even in the, in the same context, really. So 120 years doesn't seem to be the right answer. How about 100 years? Because in Genesis 5.32, we were told that Noah was 500 years old when he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Doesn't mean they were triplets, just the oldest was born at that time. But um, the flood came when he was 600. So... There's a hundred year difference right there. So that's how long he had to build it. Except when God told him to build the ark, he said it's going to be for you, your wife, your sons, and your son's wives with you. Sounds like the boys are already grown up and married when God said build the ark, doesn't it? Which would mean what? Well, it's going to be less than a hundred years. How long would it take for the three boys to be born to grow up and then get married? Maybe 25 to 50 years? So subtract that from the hundred and you have a maximum build time of 50 to 75 years. Now, I don't know if it took that long. Um, that's just, I'm saying that's about the maximum that we can get from Scripture. But think about this. If you're building something out of wood and it's taking you 50 years, so you start way down there on one end and 50 years later you're way over there on that end, what do you have to do to that end again? You kind of fix it, don't you? Because wood doesn't last super long out in the elements and everything. So I don't know that it really even took that long. That's just the maximum. So how did Noah find all the animals? Oh, the skeptics love this one. And they, are at, they, they ask this one a lot. Do you really think that Noah had to go to Australia and find the kangaroos and the koalas and, and he got back and he's like, oh, guys, we forgot the wombats. <laughs> Japheth, go get them. Is that really the picture that the Bible gives us? No, remember we said we think that the world is very different. There, 
with all apologies to my boss, um, there was no Australia at the time. Okay? Remember, God created a perfect world. Um, <laughs> just kidding. I'm kidding. I, I like Australia. But um, it, there was no Australia. There was no any of these other places yet either. It's very different. But if we start from the Bible, we have the answer to this question. What does it say? Genesis 6, 20. A bird's after their kind, of animals after their kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. He didn't have to go look for the animals. And yet, how many times have we heard that? Guys, if a skeptic asks you a question about the Bible, don't take their word for it that it says what they claimed it says. Okay? Have them show you from Scripture before you start answering. Let them prove. A lot of times they've never looked at it. They've just heard it and they're repeating it. But if they've looked at something and they're genuine about looking for an answer, they can show you in the Bible where it is, or you can pull out the Bible and show them. So start there. All right, always take it back to God's Word. Now, this is really one of the big questions that we had to figure out. How did he fit all the animals on the ark? And we've heard all sorts of crazy numbers. Okay, I get emails saying, how did he fit all 6 million? How, how did he fit all 8 million species? How did he fit 11 million species? I've heard 80 million species. It's like they're just pulling numbers out of a hat. Anyways, those are all pretty high numbers. Uh, one of the skeptics who was trying to respond to a video done by Ken Ham, here's what he did, and he put this picture in his, his response, his rebuttal, trying to make the ark look silly. Do you guys see anything that looks sort of fishy in that picture? <laughs> um, I understand whales are not fish, technically, but um, why would he have to bring the whales? The last time I checked, there would have been a pretty big pond outside the ark during the flood. In fact, it was bigger than the oceans had ever been before. Okay, since day two of the creation week. So that's the most, the most space the whales would have ever had is during the flood. He wouldn't have to bring the sea creatures. Okay, but they often include those they, they, when they want to make fun of this idea. So let me ask you this. What do we have to know in order to answer this question? How could he fit all the animals on board the ark? You have to know... What kind of, how many, right? You have to know how many animals. What else do you have to know? How big was the ark? So ask those two questions when somebody says, how could he fit all the animals in the ark? You know what you usually get? Uh, how big was the ark? I don't know, but there's no way you could fit all the animals on it. Well, how many animals do you need? I don't know, but there's no way you could fit them all on the ark. The two things you have to know, usually they don't even know. They just know that you can't do it. Well, we had to figure it all out. So in order to figure out the size of the ark, Let's take a look at what the Bible tells us. It gives us the answer to this one. We know the size. Uh, roughly, we have to know what cubit they used. The length of it shall be 300 cubits. The, it's width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. So the cubit, again, this measurement from here to here. So which cubit did they use? Well, the common cubit in biblical times, now it's weird to say biblical times because that covers a long time period, many thousands of years. Okay, But in the time of the Israelites in uh, in Israel, when they were in Jerusalem, at Hezekiah's tunnel, we can look at the cubit that was used for that. It's 17 and a half inches. Some people say 18 inches. So somewhere in that range is the common cubit. Now, many of the ancient building constructions were done, the, the huge projects were done on what's called a royal cubit, or a long cubit. You take this measurement, and then you would add the four fingers to it. So that would be a royal or a long cubit. And uh, why did they build? Why, did, why are a lot of the ancient building projects done that way? We're not sure. Maybe they got it from a different idea, such as another important building project that they would have all been familiar with, the ark. So what we did is we took one of the shortest of the common cubits and then made a long cubit out of that by adding 2.9 inches. You get 20.4 inches. So our ark is 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet tall for a total volume of 1.88 million cubic feet. Now, if somebody's a math whiz, they're probably looking at it and saying, that math isn't right. Well, we've subtracted 15% for the volume because of the curvature of the hull and everything. So the math is right. I just didn't show all of it. Now, how big is that? Well, this is difficult for the people in the Cincinnati area to figure out where we are. They don't quite get this one when I show the picture. Okay? But where I'm from, where I grew up, we know exactly what this is. I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So this is called a football field. Um, and... People in Cincinnati are like, what is it? It's sort of like a soccer field, but a bet much better game is played on it. Um, so this is what it looks like next to a football field. Okay, it's huge. So how many animals had to go on the ark? Well, here's from the journal Science back in 2013. So five years ago, they said, we argue the number of species on Earth today is five plus or minus three million. 
of which 1.5 million are named. Don't you like how specific they are? Anywhere from 2 to 8 million. We've identified 1.5 million, and we're estimating there's this many more. Now, there are some people, or I'm sorry, the IUCN red list, which is what we use for the, the, um, the endangered species list, they say there's 1.78 million species. Okay, so a little higher number than what they say are identified. But here's what they're not telling you. They are including all of the bacteria and one-celled organisms that have ever been identified. If Noah had to bring those, they would not take up much space. They are including all of the marine creatures. Remember the whales that you saw in the one picture? Every, most of the life on Earth is in the oceans. They're including all of the marine creatures. He didn't have to bring the marine life. He didn't have to bring the fish or the eels or anything like that. They're including a million different species of insects. He probably did not need to bring insects. Okay, maybe the more delicate ones like butterflies and moths and bees, but they don't match the description of the animal that had to go on board the ark. And we're dealing with kinds, not species. What's the difference? Well, if you think of the, the classification system that we have, so you have like kingdom, phylum, order, uh, class, or class order, and then uh, family, genus, species. A lot of times people think, oh, it's, you had to bring all these different species. No, you, the... The um, kind level is roughly equivalent to the family, so you go up a couple levels. It's not always equivalent there, but think about it this way. Um, well, let me show you an illustration. These are all different species of Tyrannosaur. Did he have to bring two of every one of those? Now, we think of just this guy here, the biggest and the baddest and the coolest, the T-Rex. Okay? That's what we usually think of. But all of these are, different, are classified as different species of Tyrannosaur. What if what God brought to Noah was something like this, one of the smaller ones, fully grown, they don't take up as much space, do they? Okay, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. Here's one way we'd talk about it at the ark. Noah didn't have to bring all of these, all of the biggest ones that you could possibly find. He just needed two of these. He didn't need to bring any of these, any of the marine creatures. I know it seems silly to even have to say that, but because they include it so often, we had to make a point of it. But he did have to bring animals that are now considered extinct. So at the ark encounter, what we've done, if you think about the way you, you, you usually think about the ark, what animals are on there? Well, you got giraffe, you might have elephant, you got a lion, you got a monkey, you got a snake, and maybe a, a rhino or a hippo, right? Those are the ones that come to mind. Well, we didn't want to do it that way. We wanted to give a more realistic picture. Obviously, each of those would have to be on. But we did about 50% that people would recognize and 50% that are now extinct since the time of the flood. So you'll see a more diverse picture than what you're used to seeing when you're there. So the other decision we had to make is how many of each kind had to go on board the ark. The Bible talks about two of every kind will come to you, but then he, he clarifies in the next chapter, just a couple uh, sentences later, that there's going to be seven or seven pairs of all the clean animals and the flying creatures are going to come to him. So is it seven or seven pairs? Well, it depends on which Bible you use. Why is there a difference? Well, the Hebrew phrase is seven, seven, a male and his female. Is that seven and it's just kind of stressing the seven or is it 14? kind of sounded like 14, but here's what we did. Every single time there's an option between a lower number and a higher number, we always went with the higher number because we don't want somebody to think that we cheated. And when we say, yeah, you can fit all the animals on board, and they're like, oh yeah, but that's because you took the lower numbers. No, we went with the higher numbers all the time. So we did that with the 7 or 14 issue, and we did the same thing when it comes to what we call splitting or lumping. What does that mean? Well, if you think about the different animals that belong in the same kind, so think about dogs. You got wolves and dingoes and coyotes and uh, foxes belong in there, uh, and the common dogs that we think. Those are all dogs. They're all part of the dog kind. He didn't need two of each of those. He just needs two dogs with a genetic variability for what we see today. And that same, thing, same principle is for so many other animals. But we don't always have the information. We need all the hybrid data to, to know whether or not one, kind, one species can interbreed with another. And so if we don't have that information, we split them into different kinds. For example, there are a whole bunch of frogs that look very similar from different parts of the world. But for whatever reason, some people haven't taken their lives studying the mating habits of those really obscure frogs. It doesn't sound all that exciting, so I know why they haven't. But we don't have that data, so we had to split them into different kinds, even though they probably belong to the same kind. And so our number is probably overestimated by quite a bit. So how many animals had to go on board the ark? Well, we had to count them all, and you can read the list on our website. In fact, you can look at the academic papers on these, uh, on the Answers Research Journal. How many amphibians? 194 kinds that are still around today. And that number, again, is probably greatly inflated because I mentioned the frogs. The same thing's true with salamanders. A lot of them look the same. So 388 total because you multiply that by two. Same thing with reptiles. Birds, you're multiplying most of those by 14 because most of them are flying creatures. There's some that are flightless. 
Uh, the mammals, some of those get multiplied by 14 because some of them are clean animals, like the cattle, the sheep, that kind of thing. And some of them are flying creatures, like the bats. In fact, we have over 300 bats on board the ark. So how many extinct animals? Well, there's the numbers. Does that add up to millions? What's the total there? Well, the total number of animals is fewer than 6,800. The total number of kinds is fewer than 1,400. And again, those are overestimating the numbers. So it's probably much less than that. How could he possibly fit all the animals on the ark? Actually, they would fit in just right. And we've run the numbers. We've had to go through and figure out how much room they take up, how much water they need, how much food they need. All of those different things have been put into our calculations. And when you put everything together, guess what? They fit just right. It's like Goldilocks. Okay, it's not too much. It's not too little. Doesn't that make sense that God would know how big the ark would need to be in order to hold the people and the animals and the food? Yeah. And it is. It's just right. So I mentioned dinosaurs a little bit ago, and people think, are you crazy dinosaurs on the ark? I mean, come on. Really? Well, guys, that's not the ark. That's a fairy tale. Okay, the ark didn't look like that. And once you explain that the ark was a lot bigger, they think, okay, I get it. The ark was really big, but really? <laughs> you think Argentinosaurus would go on there? I mean, they estimate they might have been between 60 and 80 tons. Well, yeah, fully grown. You don't have to take the biggest ones. You take the ones God brings you, and why would he bring the biggest ones? In fact, you could bring juveniles. Uh, the, even the biggest ones were once much smaller, and before they were that size, they were this size, about the size of a football. I'm not saying that Noah rolled eggs up the ramp of the ark. That's not my point. Uh, I don't think he did. I don't think he had incubators in the ark. But after they hatched from there, they're not that much bigger. So why would you bring smaller ones, the juveniles? Well, for a lot of reasons. One, the very obvious reason, they take up less space. There's a, a good reason. Number two, they eat less. If you're in charge of feeding them, that's a good thing. And this is even better. Number three, they have less waste. If you're in charge of cleanup, then you're very thankful that, for that. They are more durable. What do I mean by that? Well, if I were to take the wrong step up here and fall off the stage because I'm over 30 years old, what happens? I break and I lie there and cry and moan for the next couple hours till I can move again slowly. And um, if you're under 30 and you did that, what would happen? You'd bounce and you'd get right back up and do it again because it was fun. Okay? The same sort of thing is true with the animals. And if you're in a ship that is rocking quite a bit on the biggest storm, stormy seas that have ever been, you might want something that's a little more durable. And here's a really important reason why you bring the younger ones, because they would have many more years to reproduce after the flood. You don't bring the oldest ones that aren't going to be able to do that. Okay? Or at least won't have much time to do that. So there's a lot of reasons to bring the smaller ones. Let's talk about some misconceptions that people have about the ark and about the flood and about Noah. And there's one right there, actually, on the screen. As I mentioned before, that is not Noah's Ark. That is a fairy tale. That is a bathtub Ark. Okay, we have an exhibit at the Ark Encounter called the Fairy Tale Ark. And it's kind of cute. It looks like you're walking into one of those things. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't take the time to stop and read what it says there. And they, they think, oh, I should go buy this book down to the bookstore because we have a lot of the different... We're not promoting those as good things. Okay, now understand what I'm saying here. I get that it's really cute. I mean, it's adorable. And, you know, when you have a bunch of cute animals and a happy old guy and you put these on the nursery wall, it's really cute. But let me ask you this. Is that what the flood account is about in Scripture? A happy old guy and a bunch of cute animals? Or is it about an extremely wicked world that had turned its back on God and was filled with violence and corruption throughout the whole world to the, to the degree that God was grieved that he had made man and he was going to wipe man out and yet he showed his grace and mercy to Noah and his family? and to the representatives of the animals on board the ark. Is that what it's about? Yeah, that's what it's about. So if this is the only message we ever convey to people, and we teach young people from, from when they're really little all the way up that this is what Noah's ark is about, and then they get to high school and they have this picture still in their mind, and skeptics start approaching them, it's a fairy tale, right? That's what's in their head. So here's what I want to say. I, just, I, I want to caution you about these things. If you do use them, please make sure that you teach the truth about them as well, that you teach what the ark was really like. It wasn't like this. In fact, only an ark of biblical dimensions can survive a flood of biblical proportions. If that's what the ark looked like, none of us would be here today. There would be no more people left. There would be no more animals left, Most, no more land animals. Most importantly, one person one descendant of Noah, 
who also happened to work with wood, would have never come to the earth. He was the son of a carpenter. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. He never would have come to the earth and never would have died on the cross for the sins of the world. So what Noah was doing was extremely important, wasn't it? And we should treat it as it should be treated. That It was a historical event, and the ark looked like what it really did, not some cartoon version of it. So several years ago, Bill Nye guy that plays a science guy on TV, um, stood right here on the stage and did a debate with, with our CEO, with Ken Ham. And he said during the debate that his, uh, his ancestors were shipbuilders in New England. And he said during that time when you know, the, these uh, large wooden ships were being constructed, he said the biggest one they were ever able to build was the Wyoming. It was a six-masted schooner, and the problem was it was 430 feet long from tip to tip. So it's not quite as big as the Ark, but it's getting closer, right? And he said the problem was that it would keep springing holes and it would twist and bend and, and water kept coming in and they'd have to keep trying to bail it out and then it sank and all 14 people on board were killed. And those things are true. But you know what? He left out a really, really important detail. And I want you to decide whether it was accidental or not. Okay? The Wyoming floated and carried thousands of tons of coal up and down the coast for over 14 years. Why do you think he didn't mention that at all? Because you can't have a wooden ship that large. Okay? There are just some difficulties that have to be overcome when you do that. And if you want to know what those difficulties are, you need to go out and buy the Answers magazine, which is available in the bookstore, because I just, the lead article is all about that, the cover article. Um, and how do I know that? Because I wrote it. So now you really got to go buy that. So I'll tell you more about that by the time we're done here. But you can build large wooden ships. There are just certain difficulties that have to be overcome, and there are ways to do that. Some people say the Bible copied from ancient flood myths. In fact, we find flood legends from all over the globe. I know because I've read over 200 of them for the, for, while I was preparing for this exhibit in the Ark, the flood legends exhibit. Every place where you see the little black dots on the map, and there's a lot more than just that, there's flood legends. And a lot of times they sound very similar to the biblical account. Now, there's some differences, but a lot of times it's about one righteous man or a favored family who was told by God or by the gods that, that the, there was going to be a big flood that destroyed everything. So build a boat, build a raft, build a canoe, build an ark, and bring the animals on board. And then the flood's going to come, and then you can start over. And sometimes there's even a rainbow mentioned at the end. Sometimes there's even animals that are sent off to check the water depth and everything at the end. So there are a lot of similarities around the globe. Now, people will say, well, the Bible just copied these ancient, ancient myths, but that's not the case. You see, the distortions of that show us the Bible isn't just picking one of them and copying it because there's differences, but the similarities show us something different, that they have a common source. And what's that common source? Well, think about it. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 11 that the whole world was one tongue, one speech, one language, and then they, God had told them to scatter, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. They didn't. They gathered together in the plain of Shinar, and then God came down and confused their language, and they scattered throughout the globe. They took their beliefs, they took their history with them, and as the years went by... They started sharing that history, but it gets distorted over time, and there's still that kernel of truth there. So the Bible gives us the real account of what happened. These ones are echoes of that. In fact, the flood account is not the only thing that's like that. You have creation stories from around the globe that are very similar to the biblical account, even man being made from the dust, and then a wind, or God using a wind to, to make him alive. That's some, you have that in several different legends. You have um, legends of how man became wicked that are very similar to the biblical account. In fact, around the globe, almost every time, you know what they have to do with? Something to do with a tree or a fruit or a serpent. In, in so many of these cultures, they have that. But again, there's distortions from the biblical account. The Bible gives us the true history. These other ones are echoes of that true history. So here's one that's a possible misconception. A lot of people have heard that it never rained before the flood, and they get that from Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 5. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. The problem with that, this verse is describing the circumstances on day 6 before God makes man. Does that mean that we can extrapolate from that point in history to well over a thousand years later and say it never rained on the earth? Some people say yes, some people, I don't really think that you can. I don't think that's the point of this verse. It's just setting up for what's about to happen. So that's why I say it's a possible misconception. Um, how about this one? Does the Bible ever say there were no rainbows before the flood? 
It doesn't. Now, God put the rainbow in the sky afterwards, but that doesn't mean that's the first rainbow that ever happened. When God said in Exodus chapter 12 to take a lamb without blemish and to sacrifice that for the Passover, was that the, did he invent lambs at that point? Or did they just suddenly take on a new significance? So he doesn't have to create something in order to use that as a symbol or a sign. Okay? He can t- take something that's already there. Let me ask you this. If you were in the pre-flood world and there was a waterfall and you got the mist coming off of, the, off of there and sunlight shines through it, what do you think you would see? I bet you see the colors of the spectrum. Okay? Now, could God have changed the laws of physics at that? I'm sure. Yeah, but I don't think that he did. There's no, there doesn't seem to be a reason that he would have done that. So how many of you have heard that Noah was an amateur? The Titanic was built by experts. The ark was built by an amateur. And we think, oh, isn't that cool? No, it's not cool. Because that means that God entrusted the building of the most important ship in history to somebody who had no clue what he was doing. What does that say about God? Doesn't God prepare his people to do the tasks that he has them, that he calls them to do? So what if Noah was already one of the best shipbuilders in the world? Have you considered that before? It's a different view than what we usually think of him. Okay, the Bible never says he was an amateur. It doesn't say he was an expert either. But he was able to do what God called him to do. So certainly by the time he got around to building it, he knew what he was doing. Or he could hire people who knew what they were doing. Does the Bible say nobody had ever seen a boat before? No, it doesn't say that. Does it say the flood only lasted for 40 days and 40 nights? Well, that was the initial flood mechanism, the fountains of the great deep bursting open and the the windows of heaven. But the waters continued to dominate the earth for 150 days before they started to go down. And again, they were in the ark for about a year. And does the Bible ever say that Noah was mocked while he was preaching and that, that he was pleading with people to go on board the ark? It doesn't say that either. In fact, you won't find a single verse in the Bible that talks about people making fun of Noah. That's strange, isn't it? Because we say that every time we retell the account. Why? Well, because our brains fill in details that we think are there. And we heard it when we were in Sunday school, and then we kind of just repeat it without ever realizing the Bible never says it. And we do that with all sorts of things. Now, let me, to be fair, let me ask you this. Noah lived in a very ungodly world, and he was a very righteous man. Do you think they made fun of him? (laughs) Probably. If there were people around, that's very believable. I have no problem believing that they did. What I want you to see is that the Bible doesn't say that they did. See the distinction? So let's not say the Bible says they mocked him. Let's make sure we understand the difference. The Bible doesn't say that, but it's very believable that they did. And that's consistent with what we see in Scripture, but it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say it itself. So I'm just trying to separate our story from what, what the Bible tells us. So we're not guilty of adding our own ideas to Scripture. Fair enough? All right, you know what? Uh, looks like we're running out of time to do this. I'm going to skip. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm actually ahead of schedule from where I usually am. I, I want to do some behind the scenes for you guys because I got to I really had a unique privilege to work with these very talented individuals that can make things that are that, that they're mind-blowing. When you go to the ark and you see the different animals, you see the different exhibits, and even here at the museum, the different exhibits, the guys that I work with and the gals that I work with, they did it. Okay? They make those things. Uh, we have this one guy named Joel, and I'm going to brag on him, even though he didn't like when I do, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, he was hired to be a sketch artist. He, he worked with my assistant, who's kind of in charge of all, the an- all things related to the animals. And he, my assistant would stick his nose in fossil books all day, trying to figure out how big the animal would be. And um, so Joel was working with him to draw those animals. And then they would take the, his drawings, and they would put them on the computer, and they would make a 3D model based on that, and then they would sculpt these 3D animals, whether they were CNC printed, um, or carved out on a CNC machine, or whether they were printed on a 3D printer, uh, whatever we were going to do for them. But Joel was a sketch artist. He had never sculpted an animal before. And once he finished all the sketches, they said, hey, Joel, do you want to try sculpting an animal? Because we need help on this. And he said, yeah, I'll try it. And so he started with this animal called Thylaca smilus. And it, when he started, it's just this styrofoam frame, and, and you know, the, the body was styrofoam, and he's got this rat-like tail, and he's got this really goofy jaw. And I'd go back and look at it, and I thought, that is the dumbest animal I've ever seen. Why are we making this thing? But then he finished it after he put fur on it, and I thought, that is one of the coolest looking animals I've ever seen. That's the first animal he's ever sculpted. Okay? It just kind of gives you the idea of how talented the guys are that I work with. Here's uh, Theosodon. These ones you can see in the ark. Um, these ones are uh, the Entilodonts. They are called Terminator pigs. Fully grown, they'd be about six feet tall at the shoulders. You would not want to be in front of them if they were angry. Okay, you would lose. Uh, here's a picture of my favorite one. There's Joel, uh, the one on the left. Um, <laughs> the one on the right is my favorite. Why? Because that's the one that I sculpted. You can laugh at that. I told you before I can't even draw a stick figure, okay? I didn't really sculpt him. I made like six little impressions on his foot. 
And that's true. I did that, and then I think they went back and fixed it. But um, just so I could say I sculpted it, or at least had a hand in it. But what is this one? This is a... It's a Tyrannosaur. That's right. Okay, it's a juvenile T-Rex. We have a lot of fossils of juvenile T-Rexes. We have a good idea of what size they would have been. We don't know if the color pattern was exactly like that, but uh, we have a very good idea of what their size would have been. We have one guy, his name is Greg, that worked on the dioramas quite a bit. And in fact, in this diorama, this is the Tower of Babel under construction, and the diorama is under construction. But um, you can see a thousand little tiny individuals that were 3D printed and about 300 different animals that were th 3D printed. And here's the size and the detail of each of those that he spent two months doing this every single day without a magnifying glass. And like he can still see straight. His eyes aren't doing this permanently, okay, which you think they would be. But that's the amount of detail he put into it. And here's what it looks like now down at the Ark Encounter. You can see the Tower of Babel under construction before God judged them and confused their language. So I mentioned 3D printing. One of the things we wanted to do, and this provides a much more lifelike uh, character in the dioramas, if you go through the, the Creation Museum, you look at the dioramas, especially in the flood room, or in, in the voyage room where the ark is, you can see the family in there. Those are done the old-fashioned way. You take a lump of clay, you mold it, and it takes you several days to weeks to get it just the way you want it. You put it in the, in the kiln, you fire it, and then you bring it back out, and you've got to let it cool down, and then you can paint it. Two to three weeks, you've got a character. Now... You build your character on the computer, and you send it to the 3D printer, and you can have one in about a day. You still got to paint it, and it depends on how big they are, how quickly they're going to print. But Travis wanted to do something to make them look even more lifelike, so what he did is he made this little uh, turnstile with these LED strips, and you just put the person in there, you have them pose, and then he's holding in his hand, I don't know if you guys can see this, anybody know what that is? If you have an Xbox at home, you might know. It's called a Kinect. And what it does, it tracks your motions. You don't need a controller in your hand to show that you're throwing a ball. You just do this, and it knows it's tracking it. So as he slowly spins her around, it's creating a 3D scan on the computer that is very lifelike. Then you just go and clean it up. Well, that wasn't fast enough for Travis. And so what he did, and by the way, then you just send it to the 3D printer, and, you, and it, you'd have your character in a little while. So he said, here's what I want to do. I want to bring in this company that has like 74 different cameras, and they set them up in a circle all the way around, and they were at three different levels, and they were all hooked up to a computer, so he pressed the one button, all the cameras fired at once, and create this 3D image on the computer. And so the actor just needs to go in, stand in the middle, and you can have the, the wind blowing on them, you know, fan blowing on them so their hair can flow like Fabio. Um, that's what they did with me. Um, but then the robe can flow, that kind of thing. You know, it, it's active. It makes it look active. Well, for one of the dioramas, they needed a giant. <laughs> Who do you think they called? Yay. You guys want to see what I look like when I get back from Florida with my tan? <laughs> and after I was printed I looked, and then primed, I looked like that. And today I look like that down in the Ark Encounter on the left side there. You can see me there. So when you go to the Ark, you can say hi to my mini-me. And, you know, people always look at it and say, why are you so mean to that woman? No, guys, she's like a serial killer. I'm the good guy in the, okay? Just remember, that. I'm the good guy. She's the one. She's the bad one. All right. So there's a little bit of behind the scenes. Let's talk real quickly about Noah's family. The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about them. In fact, um, really, we know, very we know about Noah, and we very know very little about the rest of them. Uh, we do take artistic license down at the Ark Encounter. We have signage up several different places telling you we're using artistic license when it comes to the look of the individuals, when it comes to the clothing that they're wearing, when it comes to the, we name the women. The Bible doesn't name them, but we gave them names. Um, even the, the shape of the Ark and the, the look of the, the Ark, the look of the animals, all of that's artistic license. Okay? We're filling in details that the Bible doesn't give everything that we need to create a themed attraction. And the reason we named the women is we want you to understand that they were real people. Okay, they had names. We don't know what they were. And people say, well, why don't you just name them like Mrs. Ham? And it's like, because when she was born, they didn't say, hey, Mrs. Ham. Because she had a real name. We just don't know what it was. But we're upfront about the fact that we're using artistic license. In fact, the first, scenes you, the first signs you see when you walk into the ark talk about that. So here, you get to see each family member once per floor. This is the only time they're all together. This is on deck one. And the flood has just started, so Noah's leading the family in prayer. Here's uh, Japheth and his wife in the living quarters. Here's animatronic Noah. You can talk to him. and ask, Well, you can ask him 14 different questions. He'll talk to you and tell you uh, some of the answers. And if you ask the right one, he'll even flirt with his wife a little bit. And you can see his wife there. So speaking of his wife, let me ask you this. The Bible doesn't tell us really anything about her other than she was married to Noah, she survived the flood, and she had three sons. That's it. Do you think it's safe to assume that she was faithful? 
I think that's a pretty safe assumption. Um, it's hard to imagine Noah doing all of the things that God commanded him to do if she was not there supporting him. That would be very difficult to, to think that way. Um, do you think she was hardworking? I think everybody on the ark was pretty hardworking, so I think that's a safe assumption. But she's unnamed in Scripture. That doesn't stop some people from trying to name her. Now, one of the most common names people give her today is the name Naama, and that comes from Genesis 4.22. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Naama. And people say, well, it doesn't say anything about her, so maybe she's named because she's Noah's wife. Maybe. I mean, it doesn't tell us that at all. So it's really just a guess, and it's just as good of a guess as any other, I, I guess. Uh, but uh, the Bible doesn't say that that was her name. And because we didn't want to reinforce that idea, we thought we'd come up with something that was different. So in, uh, by the way, she's called that in Genesis Rabbah in the 5th century AD. Um, the, the book of Jasher, which is mentioned in Scripture, uh, in Joshua and 2 Samuel, the one that you can read today is not the book of Jasher. It's a modern-day forgery. Uh, so don't think that that's the one that's mentioned in Scripture. But the, the modern-day forgery calls her that as well. Another name that she was called in the past was the name Emsara, and that really just means like ancestor of Sarah. So people would connect Abraham, Noah to Abraham, so they connect Noah's wife to Abraham's wife. Um, so she's called that in the book of Jubilees, which was written in the 2nd century BC. It's called Little Genesis because it takes little bits of Genesis and then kind of expand the story. It's kind of like historical fiction. It's not inspired by God. It's not part of scripture. But here's what it says. Noah took to himself a wife, and her name was Emsara. And we happen to like that name, so guess what we called her? Emsara. Um, now, in 1941, there was a paper published called The 103 Names of Noah's Wife. Pick one, okay? But pick a good one, because she was our, all of us, great, 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 a whole bunch of times, grandma. Some of you get a few more greats in there, the young people in there. Okay, we're all related. We all go back to her. Okay, that means we're all one big family. So that means we are all related. The Bible tells us that we are all made of one blood. In other words, there is no basis for racism in Scripture because we are all related. Now, some people have tried to use Scripture to promote racism, but the Bible does not give any permission. And in fact, there's nothing in the Bible that teaches that. Okay? We are all made in the image of God. And Jesus Christ died for all, not just for people who might look like you. Okay? So, again, we're, we're all one blood, and we talk about that here in the museum in the, in the Babel exhibit. So let's wrap it up by talking about who Noah was. Who was this guy? Well, the Bible does give us more information about him. You can read about the historical account of the flood, the ark, and, uh, and Noah in Genesis 5 through 9. You can read details about his character in Ezekiel 14 and Hebrews 11. And the Ezekiel 14, when I always get a kick out of this, it, God is describing the wickedness in Jerusalem. He's saying you're going to judge them. They're going to be wiped out. And that's not the part I get a kick out of. But he says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would save only themselves by their righteousness. Noah is put in the same category as Job and Daniel. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know what's even cooler? Ezekiel wrote that, meaning that Daniel was alive when that happened. So he put Daniel in the same category as Job and Noah. That should tell you something about Daniel's character. And you can read details about the time in which he lived in Matthew, Luke, and 2 Peter. We know he was a righteous man. The Bible says uh, that God said to him, Come into the ark, you and your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. He was a hard-working man. God told him to make the ark of gopher when he goes through and says, Here's how you're going to make it, and all these different things. And Noah did all of those things. He was a blessed man. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He was a husband and a father, as we've talked about. God said he's going to establish his covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. He was a faithful man. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. And finally, Genesis 6, 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Wouldn't that be a wonderful testimony for each one of us? If you could put your own name in place of Noah's name. Thus, Tim did, according to all that. Well, I know I've blown that a billion times. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live godly lives, and we should be striving to do that. We should be striving to honor him in all that we do. So why build the Ark Encounter? Is it just so that we can have a really cool-looking ship out there? Well, that's one of the reasons. Actually, it's a building that's designed like a ship. Is it just so we can answer the skeptical questions? Well, that's one of the reasons, too, and that's an important one, but it's not the most important one. Why build the Ark Encounter? Because we have the most important message that could ever be shared. 
and we have the gospel of Jesus Christ that we're going to proclaim. We, we share it several times in the Ark Encounter. Here's one way that we do it. We call this the doors of the Bible. We know that Noah and his family had to go through the door of that Ark to be spared from the physical consequences of the flood, right? They weren't saved eternally because they walked through a doorway, but this picture is uh, something, it's a good illustration for us of of what would happen later on. And in fact, so do some other doors in the Bible. They provide a good illustration for us. Think about this. When God told Moses and the Israelites to take a lamb without blemish and to sacrifice it and to take some of the blood of that spotless lamb and to, to put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of your house, that night the destroyer would pass throughout the land of Egypt and those who were not covered by the blood of the spotless lamb would lose their firstborn. Okay? It teaches the importance of atonement, being covered by the blood of a spotless lamb, uh, of, this, of sacrifice. And then 500 years later, roughly, Solomon builds the temple, and in the innermost part of the temple, he creates the Holy of Holies, or they build that, and he puts these two large olive doors on the outside of it. They remain closed every day of the year except for one, the Day of Atonement. Why are they closed? Because God is holy, and his presence is there, and man is sinful. We are separated by God because of our sin. And that's what these doors represent. Once a year, the high priest could go in there and make atonement for the people. Then Jesus comes along and says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He says, I am the door of the sheepfold. He is the only way in or out. This is what he was talking about, guys. The shepherd actually sits in the door. They are the door. The sheep cannot go in or out except by going through him. He's talking about being the only way. Just like when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. All of those things are pointing forward to this, aren't they? When the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ, our Passover is what Paul calls him, shed his blood on the cross for me and for you in our place, paying the penalty that we deserve, dying the death that we deserve so that we can be forgiven, so that we can live eternally with God. Each of those doors are pointing forward to this, but you know what's really great about this? This isn't the end for us because three days later, there's another door we get to talk about because Jesus Christ came out of that door alive and well. He had conquered death, he had conquered sin, he conquered the grave. And he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. All who believe in him are given the hope and the guarantee of eternal life. And then we can ask this question about two more doorways, the wide gate that leads to destruction and the narrow gate that leads to life. And we can ask our visitors if they are on the narrow gate that leads to life. And of course, that's through Jesus Christ. So that's just one way that we present it at the Ark Encounter. So why build the Ark Encounter? Because we have the most important message that could ever be shared. Think about this. If all we were doing is building a big structure and putting some animals on there with no teaching, Do you think the skeptics would really object that much? No, but because we're saying the Bible is true from the very first verse, the Bible is our authority, and by the way, Jesus Christ is the only way. Because we proclaim those things, that's why they object. That's why they protest. But we're going to continue to proclaim that. We can go all day talking about this, and I enjoy talking about this, but let me tell you about some of our resources real quickly before I get you out of here. Uh, we got a couple of freebies here for you. This is the Answers Update. So it comes out every single month as our newsletter and actually just underwent a new a, a redesign, so it'll look a little different than that. But it tells you about some of the latest research, some of our, our specials that are going on, some of the, the latest news. Um, and how much does it cost? It's free, okay? We just need your name, address, phone number, credit card, social security number. And, no, I'm just kidding. We don't, we don't need those last two things, all right? But if you sign up for that today, you can also get this DVD for free. This is Ken Ham. He's our, our founder and uh, CEO, and this is his own personal testimony. He actually talks about the construction of the Creation Museum, some of the hurdles we had to go through or over to build this place. Uh, we have our Answers Magazine. These are not free, but uh, we recently redesigned these. They used to come out four times a year. Now they're six times a year, and there's a kid's pull-out section. They can learn about the same things mom and dad are learning about, but a level they can understand. And here's the deal. If you sign up for this today, you get the current issue free, and then you still get one whole year after that. So it's like getting uh, seven for the price of six, and you also get the digital copy as well. So you can put that on the tablet or the phone for the young people to read, and you can have the paper version if that's what you prefer. Um, We have our pocket guides on sale for just $2 each. Several of these, they're about 96 pages uh, of information just for two bucks, but we've got one on the global flood. We've got one on Noah's Ark. We've got uh, dinosaurs. So a lot of things we talked about today are in the pocket guides. We also have this special going on. You can take any of the books, DVDs, or CDs that you see out there that have a green dot on them. Any three for 35, five for 55, 10 for 95, 15 for 129, but I know you really want to do what the good Christians do, and that's buy 30 for 199. I'm just kidding. You don't have to do that to be a good Christian. You got to buy the ones that have my name on it. Um, (laughs) You don't have to do that either. That's a joke. Uh, You should do that. No. Um, People say, well, I'm not going to read 30 books. I'm not that heavy of a reader. But if you could recommend just a couple of resources while I'm here so I can understand 
uh, how to better answer the questions that people have. How can, what are the things that you guys face the most? What kind of questions? How can I deal with those? Guys, pick up the answers books while you're here. There's a four-volume set called the New Answers Book. In fact, so there's a fifth one that it's not called the New Answers Books, but it's called the Flood of Evidence, and it's all about the, the flood, like we just talked about. That goes along with this now as well. So you can get the four answers book at, uh, books at that price or add the fifth one. There's a different price on it. Uh, we've got Journey Through the Ark Encounter, and there's a new book. I don't even have the slide for you. Journey Through the Creation Museum. So they're like the coffee table style books. You open that up, and it's got all the beautiful pho photography. Um, the Doors of the Bible presentation I showed you just at the very end there, that's part of an exhibit called uh, Why the Bible's True or Searching for Truth is uh, at the Ark Encounter. You can get, it's like walking through the pages of a graphic novel. So that's just one part of that huge exhibit at the Ark. We have Inside Noah's Ark, uh, how it worked or why it worked. Uh, that one's available. It goes through a lot of how could they get the fresh water, how could they get ventilation, fresh air, how could they do all these different things they needed to do while they were on the Ark. Uh, my book, Old Earth Creationism on Trial, has two chapters about the extent of the flood. Was it a worldwide flood or just a local flood? What does scripture say in dealing with the arguments used by uh, Christians who try to argue for a young earth and critiquing the arguments, not the people? Okay, treating them with gentleness and respect, but critiquing the arguments they use. We have one of these rhyme books, you know, A is for such and such, N is for Noah, and it's set up as this, um, the way it is so that you have the story in the front there for the young people, and on the back you have the same sort of thing, but then it has teaching points as, as well. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do is take this information that we teach here at the Creation Museum at the Ark Encounter and put that into an action-adventure series for young people. So a lot of the issues we cover in the Answers books I've wrapped into an action-adventure uh, story for young people with time machine, explosions, dinosaurs, all that fun stuff, but they're also learning how, what does it mean to have a biblical worldview? How can I witness to my friends? Uh, how can I answer these questions? What about dinosaurs in the Bible? What about carbon dating? What about uh, who was Cain's wife? All those different things we hear on a regular basis. There's a study guide that walks them through 15 of those issues in more detail. So you can get those. And one of the things I was asked to do for the Ark Encounter is to write this exhibit called Who Was Noah? And they wanted me to write a fictional backstory based on the, detail, the few details we have in Scripture about how Noah could have acquired the skills that he obviously had, uh, just to, to give an idea of what he might have been like. And so I did that, and people liked the exhibit. They said, well, you should write a, you know, a novel about that. And I thought, I don't want to write a novel about Noah because when I get to heaven, I don't want him to walk up to me and go... <laughs> What were you thinking? Oh, you might have to reach up like that. I don't know. I was way smarter than that. Okay, and I, so I was a little nervous about that. I thought, if, I, if there's a way I can do it where I can separate our story from Scripture and make it very clear which one's which, um, then I'll, I'll do it. And so I got together with, with a friend, and we ended up writing a trilogy called the Remnant Trilogy. So there's a second one, there's a third one, and those are all available now. The last one just came out a couple months ago. And there's a section in the back of each of them called Encounter This, where different details that are in the story you can go see it at the Ark, you know, because I knew what different props were going to be there, different things in the exhibits, and so we worked those details in it. The backstory that you see for the women at the Ark, it all comes from the story. So it's integrated fairly seamlessly with the things at the Ark Encounter. So let me close in prayer, and I'll turn it. Guys, thank you so much for your attention today. Let me, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. You've given us thank you for the opportunity to talk about your faithful servant, Noah, and uh, thank you that he was willing to do all that you had commanded to do. May we be as obedient uh, to the things you commanded us to do. Thank you for every person here. We pray that you give them safe travel. They, as they go, to they give them a wonderful time here at the museum. Lord, the things that they would not just be head knowledge for them, but it would actually uh, impact their lives. We would use that to impact the lives of others for eternity. Uh, Lord, may we boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to each and every person because this world so desperately needs to hear it. And we pray these things in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Tim. Tim, will you be available outside in the lobby area afterwards? So Tim will be available just outside these doors in the lobby to answer any questions you have. Just give him a couple of minutes.